Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be asked by you to present to you today on emotional intelligence. Let's first start with the first, let's go to the first slide where I'm going to meet you there. Okay. Um, today I'm going to present some different models on emotional intelligence, but also on communication. And then we're going to later on go through some hypothetical situations and hear what your reactions are. And what I ask on many of these questions that I'm going to ask is that you answer with what your initial reaction would be. So not necessarily the professional two-minute delayed reaction, but what's the gut reaction? Because that is going to drive our behavior and gives us a lot of insight into what we're going to do next. So let's begin with the, the first slide with Peter Salovey, who is the president of Yale, but was also one of the primary researchers on emotional intelligence. And he was studying different types of intelligences when he started to look at emotional intelligence and saw that it contributes largely to people's personal and professional success. And he said, law is human interaction in emotionally evocative climates. Any lawyer who can understand what emotions are present and why is at a tremendous advantage. And I think this is for both the client and yourself. So emotional intelligence is about, one, having empathy for other people, so recognizing where your clients are at, and then also recognizing emotions that you have in the moment and how they can interfere with decision-making. Let's move to the next slide, which is called the waterline model. Many times in organizations, I'm called in to help fix people. And how this works is um, I'm asked in a team, I'm trying to use a name here. We'll call, um, uh, what's a name that I could use that not everybody, we're going to just use my name. How about that? Not everybody has my name. So I go to a team and they say, you know what? Our team would be so much better if we could just fix Hartley. That's the problem on our team. Fixing someone is pretty hard, and that's often um, a really deep place to start. So I like to back up a little bit, and one of the things that I like to use is called the waterline model. And here's what I see that happens in organizations and in teams. As you see on the top, there's a task bar that's running across. Imagine that you are on a boat on top of the water, rowing towards an island. And that would be at the end where the arrow is at. Sometimes when you're on this boat, you have disagreements, you have conflicts. It's not an easy row to the island. And even though you make it there, you don't necessarily want to work with the people that you rowed with. So it was a highly dysfunctional process to make it to success. When that happens, Teams tend to do the task harder. And what that looks like is they'll row faster. They'll do more overtime work. They'll try to just do task, 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 thinking. Doing the same thing over and over is going to get them a different result. But as we all know, doing the same thing over and over, even harder, expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. So instead of when you start to look at the task as something that you should do more of, I suggest you drop underneath the waterline, which is the maintenance piece of teams. And if you look down here, you'll see in the really deep part is called the intrapersonal, and that's within an individual. And the way that I like to describe this is when you're in the ocean and you're swimming in the ocean, as you become deeper and deeper into the ocean, it becomes darker, more cold, there's more pressure. But I would rather have us snorkel than dive. Diving to try to fix somebody is pretty, uh, I, don't, I don't know if they've got, um, I don't know what they really have going on with them. It could be a personality disorder. I can't really change that, and I'd rather start with something easy. So I suggest you start with roles and goals. Any leader on a team should be able to ask their teams, what is your role and what's the goal of the team? What's the role within the team? What do you impact? What's the goal of our specific team? What's the goal of the organization? Many conflicts that I see on teams have to do with people not understanding, clearly identifying what their role is and what the goal is. 
So if you're on the boat, I could think my role is rowing, but I'm rowing to Australia, where the other person is rowing to New Zealand. And we're going to have conflict about that because we're both rowing harder, but we're both making the boat go in different directions. Once we understand the goal clearly, then conflict tends to dissipate. So start there if you have conflict on your team. The next piece that I would go to is the dynamics and development. So this is group. These are how are decisions made in your team. Does your team know that they can make decisions on their own, or do they need to go to someone to ask for permission? You give everybody this information so the team can run really fluidly. And then finally, the interpersonal part here, and that's the conflict between two people. Again, if you look at roles and goals in the beginning, generally a lot of conf uh, conflict goes away. But we're going to show some tools today that will help you deal with the interpersonal conflict if roles and goals don't eliminate it. Still, if we find that there is one person who really needs help, we're going to do coaching and feedback there. But start closer towards the waterline. So a lot of today's work is on maintenance. It's on the communication skills. You can be highly technically skilled, but not know really anything about working with people. So I'm going to teach you the people side today. So we don't work with robots. Um, sometimes it would be easier if we did. Uh, they don't talk back, at least I, I don't, not yet, at least. Um, so practicing law is working with people. And you can have a very high IQ. Again, be technically skilled, be an expert at what you do. But if you don't know how to work with people, it's going to be hard to be successful. We also see that if you use both emotions and intellect, you tend to have better decision-making skills. You make better decisions. Part of that is because you don't let some of the emotions that might be, uh, that might have nothing to do with the decision at hand influence what you're making a decision about. And I actually think this is something that lawyers are really good at, is sort of putting it aside of maybe I'm having some emotions or feelings about an interaction I had at home, and I'm able to put that aside and make a clear decision at work about another subject. But we want to put both of them together, also particularly with our clients. We miss times to connect with our clients and connect with people in our relationships because we don't acknowledge their emotions. And on a very foundational, fundamental level, humans want to connect with other humans, and we want to feel less alone. And that's where the emotion piece comes in. There's been lots of talk about, in sort of the emotional intelligence world, about how IQ is only 20% of what makes you successful, and 80% is EQ. This is, uh, this is not 100% true. What I would say is what we see is IQ helps you to a certain point. There's another 80% that's all different types of intelligences. EQ is part of that. The ability to get along with people is more critical than intelligence, decisiveness, or job expertise in achieving bottom line results. And how I look at that is if we can influence and inspire and lead other people, they're going to be loyal. They're going to want to work for us. We can uh, influence at all level, all levels within an organization, all levels of um, other organizations that we're influencing, if we can do that, we can move forward and be more successful and effective. If we don't have those skills and we're just looking at technical results, we might not get as far as we need to. Plus, we want word on the street to be good about us, that we take time to connect and build relationships. The definition of EQ that I'm going to use today is from Goleman, Daniel Goleman, who wrote uh, Leading with Emotional Intelligence. He's also written Social Intelligence. In 1995, he was on the cover of Time. He wrote an HBR article, and he made emotional intelligence sexy for people. And it sort of caught on fire then. It has become more and more of a hot topic, I think, in the last mm, five to ten years. When we first tried to get a Leading with Emotional Intelligence course into the MBA program at Seattle University... Ten years ago, it was not um, met with welcome arms, and now, as was said in the beginning of the webinar, it's now the most popular elective in the 
program, and we have more and more people, students coming from other schools, including the law school and our school of education that are coming over to take this course because it's such a good class on how to work with people. Because as you move up within an organization, your work becomes more about people. So the definition is the capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others and for managing emotions effectively in others and ourselves. Basically, this is that I can recognize what's going on with me in the present moment. I know what I'm thinking. I know what I'm feeling. I know what I want. And I can also sort of sense the feeling in the room for the meeting. If I can walk in and I can, I can tell maybe something didn't go so well or people are feeling very happy, I have empathy for other people. And I use this information to make choices. We run a lot on autopilot, and we don't make choices. We react to a lot of things. And if we can create space in between this stimulus and response, we can have choice to be effective in the moment. Goldman created four quadrants around EQ, and generally people, when they're talking about emotional intelligence, use these four to describe what it is. So let's start with self-awareness. Self-awareness, again, is I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses, I know what I get triggered by, um, I know my history, what's worked well, what hasn't. I'm aware of emotions as they're happening. I can be very self-aware, but I can have no self-management skills. I can walk around the office or walk around the world being very angry and aware that I'm really angry, but if I'm not managing that well, I'm probably scaring a lot of people off. So management is about self-control. It's about controlling your emotions so they don't control you. Emotional intelligence is not about being nice. It's not about being mean. It's about showing up in a way where you can share what you're feeling, share what you're wanting, And that doesn't scare people to run away. We want to make it so that you stay in relationship with other people. You're able to express your truth and continue that conversation. So I can be angry or I can be frustrated or I can be sad, but I can say it in a way where people still want to have a conversation with me. By managing my emotions, again, I'm going to say this a lot, it also gives us choice. Emotions are are very hot and can drive our behavior. They can be in the driver's seat. And if we're not aware and conscious about that, they're, they're going to sort of make us do things that maybe we, looking back on it, didn't mean to do or wasn't the best thing to say or we sent that email a little quicker than we should have. So with management, again, we can have that choice and be in relationship with people authentically by building relationship, not by scaring people away with our feelings. Then we go to social awareness. So again, this is I have the pulse of the room and I can recognize what's happening to my team, how they are feeling. I also have empathy for the other. So I can track somebody's facial expressions. I can actually feel what's going on with them. And then I can determine how to act with them based on that information that I'm getting from them. Lastly, relationship management, which is where all this comes together. And this is about using self, social, self-management, self-awareness, and social awareness to have better relationships. So you inspire people, you lead people, you help others reach their full potential, you build loyal, rich relationships. We have to start, though, at self-awareness. And we start there because we have more greater ability to change ourselves than we have of other people. And if we don't recognize what's going on with us, it's pretty hard to recognize what's going on with other people. So generally, we start with self-awareness. How you can recognize EQ behavior in other people. And I think if you look around uh, your office or um, other teams that you're on and even even personal relationships that you have, you're going to start to see that person has high emotional intelligence. You might not have labeled them that way, but they are exuding these characteristics of somebody who is highly emotional intelligent. So they're able to, again, say things in a way that people still want to hear from them. And what I mean by that is if you have somebody who is uh, very blunt or who is really rigid in how they 
speak to others, particularly if it's leadership within an organization. That sets a tone and a culture that um, generally people, you're not getting the best out of your people. People can be in a culture of feeling afraid. Um, but, so it's not about going to the other extreme where we're, we're very, very nice and anything goes. It's, it's about being respected and saying our truth and hearing other people. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a model. I don't want to get too far ahead. But I'm going to give you a model that's called Conviction Connection that looks at this more in depth. So we'll sort of hold that a little bit, and we'll come to that in just a, a few minutes. You're going to see strong loyalty from clients and associates and staff, people who have high emotional intelligence. You'll see that staff wants to come to them with questions, that clients want to work with them, that it's, it feels good to be around them. They have wisdom. They listen to you. Like, they really listen to you. Um, and, they, and it feels like they hear what you're saying. I had a student in my class on Saturday say, I think this is the first time that I've actually listened to somebody. A lot of times I'm just hearing them. And listening is, is one of the most critical skills in emotional intelligence because generally we're doing like one of two things when we're listening. We're waiting for the other person to stop speaking so we can speak because what we have to say is probably ten times more important than what they're saying. Or we're sort of like loading our guns, waiting to blast through their argument and not really taking in the information. We're, we're more about beating them or winning. So actively listening, you're going you're gonna to feel that with somebody who is highly emotionally intelligent. And these are the people that there's just something about them that's hard to replace. Like, this is the person on your staff that can get along with people at all levels of the organization and is, is highly respected. And I often say to managers and leaders that the job isn't necessarily about being liked. It's about being respected. And you're respected if you're consistent in what you do. And if you consistently show up as yourself and show up in a way that you're able to say your truth that draws people in, and I think this is sometimes what people talk about in emotional intelligence that is a place that they, they have some fear about going, is leading with vulnerability. And if you don't like the word vulnerability, we can say leading with transparency. A leader is able to be transparent about where they're at. They admit their mistakes. They ask for help. That's somebody that you want on your team. And even though you can have somebody right next to them who is as technically skilled, it's the person who can work well with people that you're going to really want to keep. When we go to listening, Lawyers who listen have fewer malpractice claims, less burnout, and actually remember why they went into law in the first place. So it's about helping people. And I, it's about winning, but it's also remember, remembering that there's a human and it's emotional of what they're going through. I've been, I've been in a, I had a very long lawsuit that lasted. I guess you will know if this is long or not. For me, it was 18 months, so that was long for me. And um, one of the things that helped me through that was just having a lawyer that would take a moment, not time, not an extended amount of time, but take a moment to hear my fears and why I was feeling the way I was feeling. It didn't take long. It was, a, it was quick moments of empathy, but it built a relationship where I trusted her in a way that I don't, I don't know if I would have trusted somebody else. But she made sure to recognize my humanness in it. And that helped me become a loyal client, and we also won, so that was also pretty great. Um, this also happens in, with doctors. Doctors tend to interrupt their patients within the first 17 seconds of coming in for help. If a doctor listens for about a minute, what we see is that people will sue less and they will think that more of their problem has been attended to. Uh, often when people come to us they, to ask us a question or to get advice, they've been thinking about it for a very long time. And when we interrupt in the first three to five seconds, 
we might not actually be solving the right problem. So one of the things about listening better and more is we'll get to the real issue. This is The next slide is a quote that I use that looks at the stimulus and response and the space in between stimulus and response. And as human beings, we are able to put a pause, like press the pause button, whereas some other animals are not able to do Most animals aren't able to do this. They see something that causes fear, and they immediately react, right? That keeps us safe. Humans, if we choose to, can slow down and make a choice on how we're going to respond. Other, another animal that has similar ability is a dolphin, just in case you need that for quiz later on. So this is a quote from Viktor Frankl, and Viktor Frankl was held in Auschwitz, and he's a psychologist who, the ama- I mean, so many amazing things about him, but one of the things that he came up with while he was being held was that he had the ability to change his response to things that were coming at him, to the stimulus that was coming at him. So he could choose how much he he suffered. And to have this ability to see this in such a, a, a dark place is, is just truly amazing to me. And many people now include this quote in their books about emotional intelligence and about communication because it puts it on us, right? We can be the ones that choose instead of just relying on habitual reactions. So the quote is, Between stimulus and response, there is a space. Within that space lies our freedom and power to choose our response. Within those choices lie our opportunities for growth and happiness. So in a sense, emotional intelligence is about doing space work. It's creating a space between stimulus and response. Generally, what we have is stimulus reaction So we're going to slow that down. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what happens in our brain and why it's so hard to do that. It's really easy to communicate clearly and well when there's no stress. But when the stress starts to rise, it becomes much harder to have a clear choice. Shanti was talking in the beginning about one of the courses that we have at Seattle University includes rock climbing, which for some people, that's (laughs) many people who are not in it. It's hard to see the connection between that and conflict. Rock climbing is about seeing different paths and choices when you're feeling overwhelmed. When you're up there on the face of the, wa- of the rock, it can be overwhelming and you can, you can start to not be able to see paths. The same thing happens in conflict. We, our brains go to mush in a way and it's hard to have choice. So we want to slow down, take a breath, and get out of what we're going to call being emotionally hijacked or letting the amygdala drive our behavior. And that's going to create options for us. So let's look at what the brain does. Here are the parts of the brain. And I'm actually going to skip just to the next slide where we look at the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for, this is our emotional part of the brain. This is our reptilian or lizard brain. This is the, the part of our brain that has kept us safe from, you know, in caveman times, saber toothed tigers. This allows us to jump out of the way of a car coming at us. Um, the amygdala, what it does is it sort of it short circuits things. It says fear, 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 action. This is really good because if we have a saber toothed tiger running at us, we don't want to react with thinking. We don't want to say, "I mean, should I should I run? Should I not run?" We want to just run. Amygdala is fight or flight or freeze is another one. So we either get really big and uh, talk back, angry, we run away, or sometimes we just get really overwhelmed in the moment. The next piece that I want to talk about is the frontal lobe or the frontal cortex. This is responsible for our decision-making, our analytical brain, our rational brain. What's interesting about the brain is that any time that we get sensory data, we get a stimulus coming at us, it has to go through the amygdala before it goes to the frontal lobe or the frontal cortex. So another way to look at that is 
We always have an emotional reaction before we have a logical one. And this is just how our brains are wired. So when someone says to me that, you know, I just leave my emotions at home and I don't bring them to work, that's, that's just pretty hard to do because that's how we are wired. The only time that we wouldn't have emotions would be when we're dead. That would be the only time. Even when we're sleeping, we have emotions. Some of us have done a really good job of compartmentalizing our emotions. So it's hard for us to recognize what they are in the moment. And it'll happen, behavior will happen, and then all of a sudden we're in it. Again, the space work is about slowing that down. We get sensory data, we feel the emotion, we create space, and then we make a choice. When we were looking at the brain a long time ago, we used to think that it was, you know, what you, what you had was what you get for the rest of your life and that it was concrete. And what we now know from neuroplasticity is that there is some malleability to the brain. We can create different connections. So even though we might have certain habits from all the way back to childhood, if we start to practice different habits now, we can rewire the brain to be making better decisions on a more consistent basis. So instead of just relying on the amygdala or relying on a reaction that I've had, which maybe could be every time I get into conflict, I get very rigid and loud, I instead could start to make choices to be different in that situation, which starts to create a different habit. It doesn't happen overnight, it happens with practice, but we have the ability to change. This is also when people say, you know, I am who I am, and this is who you get. My response to that is, that's a bit of who you're choosing to be. So if things aren't working in relationships for you, you go to certain teams, or you go to certain members on your teams, or personal relationships, and you've been trying the same thing over and over and reacting the same way, it might not necessarily be about the other person. It might be that we need to change how we're entering in that relationship. And we can do that because we can start to have different habits and patterns in our brain. So I love, I get very excited about neuroplasticity because it means for the most part, people can change bad habits. I say this also, um, that, you have, <laughs> that you have all parts of your brain. And this, seems, this might seem funny. I recently had a student who was missing part of uh, his frontal lobe. And that was, that was a really hard space to teach in because there was no impulse control. So it was me teaching with somebody commenting the whole time. Um, even with that, over our 60-hour course that he was in, he made some, some strides and some changes in his behavior. He might not be able to make as many. Um, he has a much harder path. Uh, he's dealing with, with a different set. So it's easier if you, have, if you have it all. Again, our amygdala keeps us safe. If we see tigers, we want to run. The thing about our amygdala is it doesn't know the difference between a tiger or a woolly mammoth, or a car coming at us, and a intense conversation with our boss, or with our spouse, or with our children. It still lights up and activates in the same way with fear, fear, fear. So if we don't have a handle on this, our emotions can drive behavior and put us into positions that maybe aren't the best for us or for the relationship. Goldman calls this getting emotionally hijacked. And it can look different for everybody. And for me, getting emotionally hijacked uh, can look like sending an email really quickly and, and not reading over it, just being very convicted in what I want and need and uh, being a little bit short-sighted. And this recently happened to me where I had six other people CC'd on it by the time it was done. Um, it was hard for me to see beyond sort of this, this one space that if I could have taken a breath and stepped back for maybe a few minutes, I could have written something a bit more clearly that didn't start, that didn't have the impact that it did. It was unintentional. Other times when I'm emotionally hijacked, I tend to shut down. I just don't even want to deal with it. I'm, I just, 
go, okay, sure, and, and walk away. And I'm curious, as you're listening to this and, and sort of thinking about your own responses to intense situations, what do some of your emotionally hijacked reactions look like? And I'd love to hear if there's anyone in the audience who would love to share. Just does it look like you're big and loud? Does it look like uh, you want to win um, at all costs? Does it look like um, you shut down? Being emotionally hijacked, this is also like very easy to see in road rage. That is getting emotionally hijacked when you're following that person in the car and wanting to, I, I don't know, are expecting to follow them to the point where they get off the exit and then you're going to beat them up. We don't, we don't think that far ahead. We're just in the moment, just really angry about the situation. People online have mentioned that they shut down, they fight back, they send off that quick fire email. Um, a few others shut down, go into par- par- paral. I can't pronounce that. Par- par- they par- Par- they're paralyzed. paralyzed. <laughs> um, they they become sarcastic. Oh, that's um, good. They stop communicating. Mm-hmm. They um, intimidate others. They go quiet. Yeah. So we have a lot of. Uh, avoidance, too. Yeah. A lot of people are chiming in online. We appreciate that. Um, thank you. Thank you. The sarcasm, I'm big with that as well. That's um, that's a double edge for me, too. When things get intense, I will I'll sometimes make a joke, um, but I'll also use sarcasm to get other pe- under people's skin. Thank you for giving all those reactions. That's that it that runs the gamut, right? So I could be in conflict with somebody who uh, gets very loud and angry, and I could also be in conflict with somebody who is just going to avoid me until hopefully I forget about it. Neither all these reactions aren't aren't the best for the situation. These are ways that we keep ourselves safe and comfortable. And again, I'm going to be talking about this in just a little bit in a model that I'm going to go through. So if we let those emotions, I'm going to fast forward here, if we let those emotions get the best of us, there could be negative consequences, right? The email gets sent too quickly, all of a sudden multiple people are CC'd, it's not what you meant, you have to do a lot of repair work to gain that trust. Um, So we have, the the consequence is on us about the stories people create about us and the perception they have uh, of us. It also impacts people around us. It impacts productivity, right? So if we aren't being choiceful and mindful and not addressing conflict in a way that keeps the environment safe, productivity tends to go down. If they're not acknowledged, if emotions are not acknowledged, they will erupt. And this is (laughs) why sometimes if you start your day out for instance, this morning, I'm going to use this morning, I pulled up to uh, my office, got out of the car, and it's raining uh, a lot here in Washington, and there was a massive puddle next to my car, which a large truck drove through and splashed me all over. So that was the beginning of my morning. And then I went in, and copier's not working. So a bunch of things start to happen in my day. Uh, parking's hard to find. All these things are happening that are that are um, adding on top of each other, right? And so my adrenaline is, is going up. I'm kind of getting slightly triggered and more and more triggered as I move throughout my day. Now if I go into a meeting that doesn't end up very well or is intense and there's conflict, I drive home in an hour commute that also makes me anxious. When I get home and my spouse says something to me that normally would not get to me, but now because I've been having sort of these little triggers throughout the day, I might explode in that moment. It takes around 30 minutes for adrenaline to get out of your system. So if we're constantly having these little things throughout the day, it's just going to be this huge, huge buildup. This is also why it's very important to be aware about what you're feeling so that we're not taking out these emotions on other people when they have really nothing to do with it. Mindfulness. This has become a hot topic. It's become a hot topic for CEOs, for leaders, uh, meditation, yoga, slowing down, 
in our day to day helps us be less stressed. And what I find is it's not it's interesting to me that many people think that they need to have a mindfulness practice that is an hour long or two hours a day. And it's not it's not really that. Mindfulness is about choosing to be in the present moment and being aware of what's happening to you here and now. We spend a lot of time in the past and a lot of time in the future. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to say. We're preparing. And then we have that conversation, and we spend a lot of time analyzing what we just said. We don't spend a lot of time in the present moment, and that's actually the only time that things can really change. Mindfulness is about expanding that space in the present moment so that we can be choiceful and fluid then and there without necessarily having to come back afterward and repair that relationship. We can have that conversation in the moment. Mindfulness can look like three minutes a day. You turn down the radio and you track what's going on with you and look around at everything around you. You put your phone down at lunch and eat mindfully for three minutes. And just this practice will make it so that you are able to stop in a meeting and do something differently than you did before. And as you get more mindful, we tend to have more choice. We also have more empathy for other people because we're building our own self-awareness. And as we build self-awareness, empathy rises for others. So it's not that it's difficult. We just need to be intentional and remember to do it. If you walk away with only a few nuggets today, one of the things that is big to remember and I think easy to remember is that emotional intelligence is about learning to pause. It's about pressing the pause button. If we took a beat and took a breath before we said things, I think we'd be amazed at how many different paths those relationships would take instead of just relying on the amygdala. So it's learning to pause. And what we're doing with emotional intelligence training is we are training the limbic system. So we're, we're lifting emotional intelligence weights, right? And in the beginning, this might just be that um, I do take a breath before I speak, or instead of avoiding a conversation, I have that conversation. It's, it's little steps that are going to, go, going to give us bigger emotional intelligence muscles. So it's practice. Unfortunately, we're not going to end today where you're all going to be EQ, Zen gurus. I would love to be able to have that ability, but it's the start of a mindful practice. So let's look at, like I said, let's look at self-awareness. Again, the starting piece for EQ. So the definition that I'm using is the ability to accurately recognize and understand your emotions in the present moment, know your strengths, your general tendencies for responding to different people and situations, and how your emotions influence your behavior. You have tendencies from your history on how you react to certain people, how you react to certain words, how you react to certain situations. By understanding that, you can then be more mindful and choiceful about how you're acting with that individual. Our mind is a pattern recognizing machine. So if I'm starting to experience something that feels similar to something I felt years ago in a, in a poor interaction, even though it's a different person, my brain might start to respond in a similar way. So I want to be aware of that so I can say, I don't, I don't actually think that's the best for this relationship. I might want to do something different. In the present moment, I recognize what my emotions are and what my wants are and what I'm thinking. That's self-awareness. And I recognize how they land on other people, too. I recognize that uh, I'm angry, but I also recognize that this type of anger maybe shuts other people down. So I have this awareness built in. And again, as I become more self-aware, I gain more empathy for other people because I'm able to sit with my own emotions. In the workplace, again, people tend to, some people say that they leave their emotions at home. Not possible, now that we know that. But there are unspoken rules in the workplace. There's cultures that are set up. And people agree with these unspoken rules. There is um, some great work by a man named Barry Oshry, who 
does work on organizational systems. He also does work on family systems. But what he comes away with is that we think that we're very autonomous in these situations, in this system that we have in the organization or the system that we have at home. But really, if anybody was put in this system at a certain level, we tend to react similarly. Meaning, if I am a middle manager or I'm a top manager, generally tops will respond in a similar way within the system. So when we're thinking about emotional intelligence, it's recognizing what is the system in this culture? What am I in? What's okay? What's not okay? And is there pressure to stay within the lines and to be a certain way? The research that I read and that I continually speak about is we are not getting the best out of our people if they are afraid. And we want to get the best out of their people. We want people to be able to come to work and to be themselves and to show their spirit and what they're good at. If people are not able to express themselves fully at work, we're not getting the best out of them. So if there's costs when rules are not followed, it's going to be a culture where mistakes are not uh, seen as a, an opportunity. So if you are a leader and you're looking at somebody who's maybe new, anybody who's making a mistake, seeing that as a place to learn and not as a place to punish creates a culture of creativity, of passion. People are, are willing to take risks that moves the organization forward and they know they will be taken care of. That's what we want. So getting the best out of the people is not having leadership, because generally it's from, most of the time it's from the top of how the culture is set up, where we're able to recognize each individual's strengths and help them when they're down. So logic versus emotion, um, Neither is better than, than the other, and um, I, you, you live in a very logical space all the time. It's very black and white, and um, I get that. And I hope that you're hearing and seeing that there's all these emotions running in the background that are also driving behavior and, and sort of working on you. So if it's a stressful situation, you have these emotions going on. If your client is stressed out, recognizing, just identifying the emotion that your client is feeling brings the energy down of the emotion. That's something that's so amazing to me, that if, if people just identify what they're feeling in the moment, stress starts to go down and dissipate. And the same thing if we can help identify what other people are feeling. So if you're really wanting to work through something tough, able to identify what others are feeling through empathy is a way to move that conflict along. So both are good. It's not one is better than the other. Again, this work is about being conscious. I sometimes talk about it, it's like becoming awake in a certain way. It's about paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. And I think the key with this quote here from John Cabot zinn is that being non-judgmental about yourself, what you're feeling, and non-judgmental about what other people are feeling and how they're acting. This is a really hard thing because we walk through the world judging everybody. That's just how our brain works, it, to make sense. But if we're in, particularly in stressful situations or in conflict with other people, if we're judging them, it's impossible to have empathy. To have empathy, we have to let go of judgment and put ourselves in their shoes. And if we stay judgeful and they stay judgeful and we're judging each other, we generally don't get anywhere. And sometimes we're waiting for the other person to take down their brick first. And I think somebody who shows true leadership and true emotional intelligence is willing to take that brick down first and say, I think I'm hearing you say you're frustrated and recognizing that. And for in that moment, then the other person can say, yes, I am. Thank you for hearing me. And just through that moment, you build a line of trust where you can move forward. When I go on teams and there's no conflict, I get uh, anxious. Teams should have conflict. If you don't have conflict, there's a system there. Something's going on. Are we avoiding th something? We're not saying something. It's it's not the greatest if everybody is copacetic. And you want to have conflict, which doesn't have to look like an all-out fight. 
But if we can get through conflict together, and if you think about this in your own relationships, if you can get through conflict together, it builds a sense of trust between the two of you that you can handle bigger, more challenging things. Conflict builds relationship. So see it as an opportunity. A lot of people don't see conflict as an opportunity or a possibility. They see it as scary. So from today on, you're going to see yourself as having a cartoon bubble above your head. And uh, this, is, this is everybody who walks around has this bubble. So right now, as I'm speaking to you, I have a cartoon bubble above my head that's uh, thinking about what are you all thinking about? How much time do I have left? Um, bunches of things are running through my brain that are determining what I say next. If I'm unaware of what's happening in my bubble, I don't have choice. So this is going to be the first thing that I ask in terms of mindfulness is that you check in with what's going on in your bubble. What am I feeling right now? What am I thinking? I also want you to look at, and we sort of determine where people are at based on how they're communicating to us. We create stories about other people. And in my next slide, I have a breakdown of communication. And I'd love to ask the audience a quick question around communication. And the first thing would have to be when somebody is talking to us or with us, how do we take in information? What do we look to the most? Is it words? Is it tone of voice? Or is it body language? Which do we rely on most to get a sense of where the person is at? So again, is it body language, the words that they're saying, or tone of voice? And I'm curious what people come up with. And generally, this would be in conflict. So think about it in conflict. What are you looking at or what are you hearing that helps you determine what the other person is feeling? We have words, a few people, tone of voice. A few people look to the body language first. I think body language is now coming up more and more. <laughs> people are just chiming in as we give it more time. But across the board. Yeah. Right. And if, if we're getting more body language, that's great, because that's actually what the, the breakdown says. So 55% of it is body language, is what we see in when we have a communication breakdown. Some people use this to talk about all communication. I'm not sure that, that this is not actually, so this got pulled out of some research, and, and um, it's been used in different ways. How it was researched was through conflict. So we're not necessarily doing these things when it's not stressful, but when it's stressful, we tend to look for body language as the, the thing that gives us the most information. So this is why email is so hard to figure out what's going on with the other person. So 7% is only words. So this is when you write to me in capital letters and then put a yellow smiley face on it. I don't know if you're being sarcastic or you're yelling at me. Uh, I, it's hard to communicate over email and, and understand fully what, that, what the person's intentions are. If you're on your, a back-and-forth email and it's you know the fourth time you've responded, it's time to pick up the phone because something is not, not clear over email. So 7% of information is words. So we're making up the rest of the 93%. We're putting in that information. Like we're, we're saying, oh, that person means this. We do the same thing when we're on the phone because we hear the tone of voice and we hear the words. Again, we don't have that 55% of information, so we make up that information in our bubble. Oh, obviously they're trying to do this. When none of that is actually really true. But this is also something for us to recognize in terms of body language. If you're someone who doesn't ever smile, I'm just going to tell you right now that Smiling is going gonna, is gonna to bring a lot of people towards you. It's warmer. And if you're like, I just, you know, I'm just not that type of person, I would say fake it. Just fake it till you make it. Um, and this being because you're building relationship that way. Even though you're not, a lot of people say this is just how my, my face sits. And I get that. And you have an opportunity to change that. Because people are making assumptions about you based on that body language, and you have some control. The control that you have is you can stay like that and just have a face like that or have your arms crossed in every meeting or be leaning back. Or you can smile, which is going to change the perception of you. And it might not be 
this is a big debate I think a lot of people that I work with have. Is this really truly me? Well, I think it's building relationship. I think if you're wanting to build trust on your team and build relationship with other people and you're wanting it to be less hard, you can do things personally about your own body language that draw people into you. People do things that they don't know are pushing other people away. And many, much of that comes through our own body language. So some of you might start, that might be your mindfulness practice, that in meetings you start looking at, how am I showing up? What's my, am I smiling? Am I uh, grunting a lot? Am I leaning back in my chair? What am I doing that's giving the impression that I'm engaged, that I'm happy, that I'm angry? Because again, people are making up those stories all the time. And I'd rather someone have a a positive story about you than a negative one. Because people are going to come to you more. People are going to want to talk to you more if they think of you in a positive light and they're not scared of you or think that you're angry all the time. Or other words that I can't say on this webinar. And this leads me to confirmatory bias. We all have devils in our lives. So we all create stories about other people. And a devil might be the client that never stops calling you, that there's always something wrong, even when there's nothing wrong. It could be uh, the mother-in-law. It could be a friend. So um, it could be a staff member who just doesn't get it right. Uh, the lazy employee, the bad employee, um, the person who's never there. So these are, these are the devils that I call. And we, we look for information to confirm our story. So confirmatory bias is... We have a bias towards something, good or bad. With a devil, we see not so positive things about this person. And unconsciously, we look for things to add to that story and create a bigger story. So everything that they do that's not right, we're like, yep, see, that's because they're a devil. That's because they do that, right? If they do something good, we actually discard that. We, we tend to not even see it. We're only looking for stuff to make sure that it fits with our story. Many of the people that we are in conflict with, we have created a good story about them. We have confirmatory bias. For the people that avoid conflict a lot, they tend to have a really good story about the person that they're in conflict with because they don't talk it out. They have a lot of time to stay in their bubble and think about maybe how bad the other person is. This is why they're doing things wrong. I can't believe they're like this. It's like, it's like the beginning story when I looked at the waterline. I need to fix this other person. This person is the reason that things are bad. So confirmatory bias gets, into tr it gets us into trouble because we'll never see people changing. So when people say to me, you know, my manager is, is such a witch. My manager is such a witch <laughs> that... Um, Even if your manager tries to be different, if you have that manager in a box or you have that partner in a box or you have that uh, friend in a box, in the devil box, you won't see them changing. So it's up to us to actually change our story about the other person before we can see them change. And this is, this is a really hard thing to do because our stories, we like our stories. It's great to be sitting here in judgment and to be perfect. Um, and to, to be open to the possibility that this person could be something else than the devil we have made them into is, is hard. We're giving up something that we spend a lot of time on. But again, people around you aren't going to be able to change unless you are open to it and allow for that in your own story and perception. This is a lot of reason when people get out of, um, when they go into treatment for alcoholism for any sort of addiction and they come out and they're in a family who you know has been through this with them before if the story about the person who's just come out of treatment is they're the black sheep oh they'll just never get it right they'll never get sober it becomes harder and harder for the person to be seen by the family as anything different other than the addict and this is why we'll see a lot of relapse is because the family isn't open to supporting them and seeing them in a different way. So our stories can have some very negative consequences, one, on how we interact with other people and also how other people show up in our lives. If you've ever had a story created about you, you, you know that it's very hard to get out of that. And it's not just negative stories. We also create stories about our angels. And these are the people that are just the best to work with. They are our rock stars. 
And we can't see them doing anything wrong. In fact, if they do the same thing that the devil does once or twice, we will discard that and we'll say, oh, and we'll let it pass. One of the things we also do when we are in organizations is that we, and this can be with anybody that you work with, we start to take work away from the devil and give it to the angel. So we have our rock stars and our top performers, and they can handle anything. And this devil is such a poor worker that we're going to take things away. So in essence, we're actually rewarding the devil and putting more work on the angel. We're punishing the angel for being good. So if you have a high performer and you're constantly giving them more and more work, what you're going to see is they're going to end up burning out and you're taking work away from people that aren't doing well, that's not necessarily a way to change behavior. This is something that some, it's sometimes really challenging to see when you're in it, but this is why people we keep people on our teams maybe a little bit longer than we should. We're also not giving them an opportunity to change. What we're doing is we're just ta- taking away the work. So I would ask you just to think about who do you have in a box, you know, good or bad, is the person that you're in conflict with or working with or anyone in your life, have you created a really good story about them and how much of that is actually true? Because our stories keep us from getting into relationship with other people. They keep us in conflict. It's not the facts. It's the stories we have about the facts. And this brings me to triangulation. And we see this happen in in families and we see this happen in organizations where – and I'm going to go through this. So I have some animations, so I don't know. I hope, hope this will show up. So there's three animations into it where you and the other person have a relationship and something goes wrong in the relationship. And we have a choice now that we can sort of go do our own thing or we can – this is another click. Thank you, Rex, for helping me on this. We go to a third party. And we tell the third party, we talk about the other person. So here's the triangulation. You go to the third party and you talk about the other person. You say, the other person is such a jerk. It's so hard working with that person. And then the third party goes, yeah, they are a jerk. There are some relationships that are solely based on talking crap about another individual. That if you were to take that topic out of the relationship between you and the third party or the person in the third party, they would actually have nothing in common. Like they go out to coffee to talk about other people. This is poison in organizations and in family households because it creates a system where there's not a lot of trust. If you find yourself being the third party and somebody's coming to you to vent, a great way to help out the situation is not to sympathize with the person because that sort of puts them into a a victim situation, it's to empathize with them. That sounds really frustrating working with with that other person. What do you want from them? What are you feeling? And having them actually get back into conversation with them, particularly if you're managing other people, you you do not want to be the third party going in between these people. It's your job to help them have an actual conversation. So it's imperative in our firms, in our families, that we help people speak face-to-face and we don't align with them. It's sticky. It's gooey. We like alliances. It keeps us safe, but it makes for a culture where we are, again, not getting the best out of our people. It's a rarity that I don't see triangulation in any organization that I work with. It is a rarity that... People make the choice to have it part of their mission to work out conflict within their organization. One of the organizations I work with, they work conflict within 24 hours, which is a huge, which is a huge commitment. But what it says is everything's going to stay above the line. You're not going to have people gossiping and eroding trust. Triangulation is huge, and I just want to put that out there, that sometimes when we have confirmatory biases about people, We're just talking about our stories, and then we're we're bringing other people into our story to create alliances, which can make the other person just basically dead in the water, which is a really horrible spot to be in. So again, I talked about instead of sympathizing that we would empathize. So we'll go to the next slide here. Empathy is the identification with and understanding of another situation and emotions, even if not in agreement with them. So this is if I'm in conflict with another individual – 
that I can sometimes think that the other person is a jerk or they're crazy. Instead, if I can gain just a nugget of empathy, which could look like, wow, they're being so passionate about this topic. I've been passionate before. I can empathize with that passion. It can take me out of a a stance of judgment to be open to listening more. I'm not listening when I'm judging. When I'm empathizing, I'm not judging. So it opens up the doors. Empathy also creates connection. And we miss this opportunity a lot because we're just trying to solve problems. So if we choose to listen, it shifts the relationship. It shifts the conversation. Most of us are spending time talking about our stories, not really the facts, and getting into conflict about that. But if we can listen to what's not being said and listen to the emotion underneath it, that's where we start to build the trust and the connection. And like I was saying in the beginning, it doesn't need to take very long. It can just look like acknowledgement of where the person is at. Like, wow, it sounds like you're feeling really sad about this, or it sounds like you're feeling really scared about this deposition that's coming up. Let me help you. Just that acknowledges that I'm not alone anymore. I talked about conviction connection, and I'm going to go into this Conviction connection, this is the model that I talked about in terms of how we show up in conflict and what our our reactions are to this. So this is where I want you to think of your initial reaction, not necessarily the one that you, after you've calmed down, but what initially happens to you because this can end up driving behavior. The first, so this is how it all looks, but I want to break it down into just here. We'll start with the conviction axes. So think of this model as the places that we tend to go, the reactions that we have when anxiety comes up in relationship or we get into conflict with other people, when there's stress. We are wired as humans to bring down, we don't like anxiety, we don't like being uncomfortable. So we're going to do anything we can in that moment to bring the stress down. And we do that through going to a few certain reactions. And I'm going to paint this in the extremes. It doesn't always have to be in the extreme, but throughout the day, you you are going to get thrown off center, so to speak, multiple times a day. It could be by your barista in the morning. It could be by the person that you're uh, driving behind in your commute. It could be by the person you work with, your spouse. You're going to get thrown off all the time, and it's your choice of how you come back to center. So first, let's, let's start with the conviction axes. And what this is, is your conviction or your point of view or stance on the issue. One of the ways that we bring down anxiety and conflict is we take a very rigid position. So it's my way or the highway. I'm right, you're wrong. There's no conflict here because I'm right and you're wrong. This is also a leader that will lead with only his or her ideas uh, when there is a stressful situation they will say, we're going we're gonna to do this without hearing any other suggestions from their team. Here's what I'm not saying about rigid. I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place for rigidity. If we are on an ambulance team and we're going out to a crash and I'm helping train you and I'm working with you, I'm not going to stand there and say, what do you think we should do right now? Do you think we should help this person or fix them this way? I'm going to start to go into motion and direct you on what to do. And that's a time and a place for it. If the only reason, if the only way that I deal with conflict is I become really right and righteous and the other person is wrong, and it's maybe not even right or wrong, but what I know is true and everything else maybe is not, that's going to have a particular impact on the people in our lives. And it might not be the best reaction for that certain conflict. So again, rigid is my way or the highway. That's how we're dealing with this conflict. I'm right, you're wrong, or what I'm doing is justified. The opposite of this would be the technical term of wishy-washy. And this would be It's a bit like the wet bar of soap you can't get your hands on. So like 10 o'clock in the morning, the person says to you, oh, yeah, yeah, that that idea sounds great. 
12 o'clock, they say that to another individual. This person does not put a stake in the ground. They don't take a position. This is also the conversation that you have at night that sometimes goes like, where do you want to go eat? Well, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. So the person will never put a stake in the ground, and the reason that they don't do that or take a position is because they are afraid of, one, conflict, afraid of being wrong, and they're afraid of not being liked. So again, two reactions to bring down the anxiety. One place I go is I get very rigid and right. The other place I go is whatever you want to do, I don't really have a position on this. Because if I were to take a position, that would create even more anxiety. And this is about bringing down the anxiety and being comfortable. Many people that I talk to would rather work with a rigid person because that person, at least we know where they're at. Um, But neither is going to to bring the best out of your people. It's going to be really hard if I'm in relationship with somebody who is rigid for me to always have the energy to talk with them about a conflict because I know it's going to take so much more work. And the same can be said about a wishy-washy person, that I never really know where they're at. And that takes a lot of work to figure out. So again, reactions about bringing down anxiety, not necessarily the best place to go. The, the hottest place, but the place that you're probably going to have the most power and influence is in the center of this, which would look like you would come to the table with a position and you would be open to influence. So all of you are experts at what you do, but you're also experts of yourself. So you're going to have an opinion, and you're going to come to to the table with that, to the conversation. But if somebody else has a better idea, you might go along with that. And by creating a space where people know that their ideas can be taken in and considered, again, people are willing to be innovative and bring that to the table. And the discussions can happen much more fluidly and quickly. The next axis is, there's actually two, two clicks on that one, thank you. So the next axis is the connection axis. And this is about how in relationships we want to be autonomous, we want to be an individual, and we also want to be connected to the other. And we don't want to be so far away in the extreme that we're super, super, super unique. We want to stay We want to stay with each other. Sometimes the example that I use is that if we're in a room of people and somebody in there is just completely naked, if you weren't listening, now you probably are, and just completely naked in that circle of people, that would be really hard to pay attention to anything. It would be too extreme for that person, and it would be too hard for us. It would be so uncomfortable we wouldn't be able to stand it. But if you look around a room when everybody, everybody's dressed differently, they're expressing themselves differently, we're the same. We're all clothes, wearing clothes, accessories, but we're all expressing our personality in different ways. We're not wearing the exact same thing. Same in relationships. We want to express ourselves, be true to ourselves, but also be connected to the other. So when there becomes tension in a relationship on the connection axes, we can go to two places. One is the enmeshed place. So this is a place of being fused or wrapped around the other person's emotions. So if somebody gets angry, I get anxious, and it becomes my job to bring down the anxiety, bring down their anxiety, which brings down my anxiety. So I'm always tracking the other person, and I'm tracking if they're happy, if they're sad. This can happen in... um, At home, growing up, you can see this. Like if mom's angry, then we all better do something to make her happier. So we learn this. I learned this growing up um, from my parents as an only child. This is I've spent a lot of place in this enmeshed area that um, my mom tended to get really big and loud and um, break stuff. (laughs) She'd break plates during dinner and when they were in conflict, which – to a seven, eight, nine-year-old, it's pretty, it's pretty intense, but I knew where she was. Like, she was rigid, but I knew where she was, and she had every right to be mad about things. My dad would get up from the table and not really acknowledge what was going on, and he would, he would go into the garage, and he would smoke a joint. So he would just go and, he would go and evaporate from the relationship in many ways. 
So what I would see was that if you got big and loud, people will leave you. And it's not that they have to go get high. He could have sat there in that discussion and not said anything and evaporated. And so I learned and have a pattern in my life that I want to make other people happy because I want to make sure they stay in relationship with me. Because once they start to leave, I get anxious. And this might be similar for people who are in an enmeshed or fused situation. If you're enmeshed, you also tend to lose yourself because you're not focusing on yourself. The other side of it, if we look at my dad or anyone, they get cut off when anytime there's conflict. So they're just not going to deal with it. They will leave the room. They'll evaporate standing right in front of you. Not a big deal. Whatever. Let's just move forward. They won't even have the conversation. And sometimes that's just because they don't have the tools to do it. So quickly, let me move through this, that if you go to certain quadrants, I have some more clicking on this. So if you are rigid and enmeshed, it's going to look like this. Like, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to convince you why I'm right. So I care about the relationship. That's the enmeshed piece. But I'm right. So everything I'm doing is justified. Uh, I will stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning trying to get you on my side, explaining to you why I'm right, because I don't want you to leave the relationship. I'm not going to get off my position, but I want to make sure that we're still together in relationship. I want to get the relationship back on track. That's what's giving me anxiety, is that it's off track. Another place that I go is, two clicks to this, is enmeshed and wishy-washy, which when conflict comes up or something goes wrong, the answer is I, pr- I, probably, I probably did something rig- wishy-washy. If you're rigid and something goes wrong, you tend to have an immediate reaction of defending yourself. The intentions were misinterpreted. Uh, obviously, they got something wrong. If you're a wishy-washy person, you'll start going through the file cabinets and be like, what did I do? What, did I, what could I have possibly done? Enmeshed is I want to get that relationship back on track quickly. So I probably did something wrong. I'm anxious about it, and I want the relationship to be better as quickly as possible. A lot of times people would just fix it in this quadrant. They just immediately try to fix things to make it better. The next quadrant is cut off and wishy-washy, which is like, yeah, I probably did something wrong, but I'm not really, yeah, I'm not really worried about the relationship. And if I am, you know, I'll deal with it when I deal with it. But, uh, you know, if this conversation doesn't happen right now, no big deal. This is the don't sweat the small stuff quadrant. So cut off wishy-washy is like, no big deal. Everything is no big deal. The thing about reacting like this a lot of times is, the truth is, is there are some things that are actually a big deal. And if that's how you're reacting, it might have a negative impact on the other person in the relationship. Lastly, rigid and cut off is, yeah, I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong and quit wasting my time. <laughs> and I don't really need to get this relationship back on track. And um, sometimes we t- call this the smoke sc- screen, where we start to talk about like how that other person is actually trying to have the conversation with us and not actually about the issue. So we'll have this conversation when you are on my terms. That's the cutoff piece. So this is how you can show up in conflict. And one of the tools that I'm going to give you today, and we're going to use it on these last scenarios that we have, is a tool that I'm going to place in the middle of con- conviction connection. And it's called, on the next slide, we call it the mush separator. So when you're in conflict, using the mush separator is going to give you access to a broader picture of what's going on for you. We tend to only share our stories with people, and our stories are assumptions. They're not facts. So if that's the only quadrant we share, it's pretty guaranteed that we're going to stay in conflict with the person. So I want to give you four four places that you can go. It's called the mush separator because when our, our brains sort of go to mush when we go into conflict. And so to, to dissect that a bit, we want to slow it down and talk about, okay, what are the facts? What's my interpretation of those facts? How do I feel because of that interpretation and what do I want? This can be used, the mush separator, it can be used in the moment. It can be used to prepare for that conversation and to analyze it after you've had the conversation. You don't have to have a conversation with somebody who already knows the mush separator to use the mush separator. You can use it, and it will help draw people in. 
A conversation using the mush would look like this on the next page. Next slide, excuse me. And I usually, I usually put in the beginning uh, my intention around having this conversation with you is what? And in conflict, particularly with people that uh, I work with, I don't have to – I don't have to be best friends with those people. I don't even actually have to like those people. But I might need to get a project done with them or research with them or get a case done. And so the intention would be I want to be able to work well with you to get through this case or I want to get this project done. Are you open to talking? The next is what I noticed, like I'm aware of this happened. We start with the facts because that is the foundation. We can agree on what the facts are. So this is my story about what happened. It made me feel this way. And what I want from you is this. And what it will give me is this. With the feeling part, because I get some pushback around this, um, particularly environments where feelings aren't, again, this is not necessarily a, a very emotional space you're in all the time, even though emotions are happening quite frequently. You don't necessarily have to share what you're feeling to the other person. If there's a lot of trust in that relationship, you can. Otherwise, just identifying it is going to be able to help you figure out what you want. So you might only share three of the four quadrants to the person. One of the critical things, though, is the, the last sentence of what I want for myself. We usually ask other people, I want you to do this. I want you to change. I want this to happen. But what if we also added in, you know, and if you did this, this would make me feel this way or this would give me this. It's that second piece that can get people thinking a little bit differently, shifting. Oh, okay, I could have an impact on this person if I changed in this way. So we're going to go through a few scenarios. The next slide is I'm going to just, uh, if we want to bounce through this quickly. You guys are, you will all have this. So again, it's about preparing for conversations, using it in the moment, reflecting, and then doing active listening. So let's go into our first case, or first case study. And I'd love to hear from people what the conversation might look like with this client. And we'll go through, and I'll walk through the mush with you, and we can see how to work this. So the first case is that a client calls the attorney at odd times, oftentimes emotionally distraught about the pending divorce proceeding. They ask personal questions about the attorney's relationship with his or her significant other. So maybe the client is looking for an ally in their cynicism, cynicism about relationships. Their conversation tends to blur the line between friends sharing and a client in need of professional guidance. So this is a boundary issue, issue to me. Um, and does this happen a lot to many, many of you? Do you get this blurred line? Sometimes you have to be a counselor and a, an attorney at the same time. I imagine that's your, your job both at all times. If you take a lot of time with this person and you start to set up the relationship where you are their counselor, that's not necessarily what you are there for, right? That's not your expertise. It doesn't mean that we need to just blow this person off. So going back to talking about the empathy piece, if you were in their position, what would this be like? And I'm sure you, if you deal with this a lot or deal with clients like this a lot, you can imagine that it's um, scary, it's sad, it's uncomfortable that this is happening, um, I think there's a lot of fear of not getting what they want out of the divorce or just shame. There's so many emotions that happen in this. But if this is happening a lot, I would set, I set the tone using the mush. So I'm going to go back to the mush here. And I think I can go backwards on this. Can I? Okay. Okay. And okay. So I'm just going to come back to the wheel. What's funny about this wheel is some of my clients now have this taped on their floor and they'll actually walk it before they physically walk it before they go into a conversation. 
So it might look like this. I'm to the client. I'm aware that I'm getting a lot of phone calls from you lately and um, you're talking about the divorce proceedings and I'm and you're also asking me questions about my relationship with my significant other. And that's it. Like those are the facts and that's what's happening, right? It's not anything else. There's no uh, um, perception or generalization about what's happening. It's just that those are the facts of what's happening. The story can be, what's your perception of why the client is doing this? The perception could be, uh, my story is, is that, and if you guys all have, if you have a story about what it would be, why would a client be calling you at all times? Oh, wait. Go ahead. Some people chiming in saying that they have made the choice not to take calls um, after a certain time and setting those boundaries. Um, and... Uh, dealing with it first and foremost that way. Um, and then some people have chimed in that this is this happens when there's a need to be heard, the client yes. is lonely, um, anxiety, um, scared, they need reassur- reassurance. Yes. There's been a loss of a significant other, fear. Yes. So lots of reasons why this, this yeah. might arise. And I think that's great, right? So that could be the story. Like, I know this is uh, this is really hard. My story is this is really hard. It's really hard losing a significant other. Um, I'm feeling also um, it could be uncomfortable or anxious about, you know, talking about my personal life. <laughs> and what I'm wanting is that we, we could connect about this case. And I also want to be able to have these conversations during – you know, working hours. And I also want to be able to hear you and we can talk about this, but I'd like to stay on track and, and keep it about your situation because I understand this is really hard. It's not about making them wrong. It's about what do I want? I want to not be having these conversations at odd hours and I don't want to be talking about my relationship because that's not what we're here to do. But it's also not about just shutting them down and avoiding them. We think that common sense, <laughs> we think that people have it and common sense isn't that common. So if people aren't going to necessarily get it by avoiding them. We think that they'll get it by we just avoid them at the office or we just don't take their phone calls. They're still going to try harder. They're still going to do it. So I like the idea of having this conversation from the beginning of I'm aware this is going on. My story is you're feeling really anxious about this and that it's, it's, you might be feeling really lonely right now. And I'm also feeling uncomfortable talking about my relationship, but I want to support you in this. Is there a way that we can do this without bringing my life into it? Something like that. I don't have it fully baked, but I always believe in addressing it from the beginning. And what some of the some of your comments are sharing is usually when somebody has that much going on with them, when they're they're calling that much or asking that many questions, it's out of anxiety and fear. So if we can address that, they just do want to be heard and reassured. It's a hard place to be, and they don't want to feel even more alone with their lawyer. So we'll do, um, I want to do, we only have a few more minutes, so I want to do this last, uh, let's go to case two. We're going to do that. Sorry that I have to get through all this again. Okay, so an opposing counsel, lawyer B, is writing highly critical, mocking, aggressive emails about lawyer A as a way of intimidating them out of the litigation they are involved in. Lawyer B is objecting to every discovery request, not replying for weeks on end, and then hammering home multiple demands without referencing the lawyer A's statements. When lawyer A brings this up, they change the topics with lines like, I was practicing law while you were still in grade school. Lawyer B keeps insinuating that lawyer A is acting unethically to a point that lawyer A is becoming worried that they will receive a grievance. This has affected their sleep. So this has affected Lawyer A's sleep on more than one occasion. These people aren't working well together. So do you have a conversation with Lawyer B? And what could that look like using... Without trying to make the other person wrong, I think that's where sometimes we start. Like, what would be your immediate reaction to this, if you start to look at it on it, conviction connection, would you get really rigid and talk about how that person's such a jerk? And, um, or would you get 
cut off and never address it. So we have to start to look at what our patterns are and what's actually serving us. Is being really right serving the relationship or is talking about how it's affecting you serving the relationship? Again, here, this might, need, might not be a place where you actually share that feelings part of the mush, but you need to have a conversation that sets up those boundaries. So is there anything coming through on what people might do reacting to this situation? We have a lot of people chiming in. Um, uh, the attempt to try to keep it professional do, and not to respond to the negatives. Um, approaching lawyer B um, directly. Keeping copies of the emails. <laughs> um, document history of exchange. Um, sorry, they're coming in really fast. So No, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And... I think a place where we could go here is to get um, – it's funny because I want to say get really analytical about it because we want to, you know, we want to make sure we have all the evidence and that, that we, we create a case. And could we talk to the person about what's going on, right? A few people mentioned trying to figure out where the other lawyer was coming from. Yeah, like what's underneath this? What's underlying and going on? And this does take time, but again, it builds relationship – that it might be easier working with this person next time. It also shows that like you're willing to do that type of hard work of having those hard conversations instead of being intimidated. I'm I respect someone who's more willing to step into the re- arena than avoid it. I'm going to sk- I'm going to skip the last case cuz what I want to do is we we've, we've uh, I have so much. This is why I have a 60-hour class and a 8-day trek to the Italian Alps to teach emotional intelligence, but I just want to keep going to the learning continuum. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave this with you to, to look at, because I'm going to go to the, a few more slides, but this is about practicing different habits. It's about practicing skills to do things differently. And you're not going to come out unconsciously conscious where you're just doing it without thinking. It's changing behavior and taking a beat. And the more we do that, the more it will become unconscious. But in the beginning of this work, it's about being aware of things that may not be serving you. And we've covered a lot of that today, right? Like how you react in conflict, how you immediately react in conflict might not be serving that particular relationship if you're always reacting in that certain way. If you don't have empathy, if you have certain body language, all of that can can stop you from being as effective as you want to be. And becoming conscious about that and starting to soften your edges can make you more successful. Moving to the next slide. So these are some suggestions I have before we close up of how to increase your emotional intelligence. Just starting throughout the day, notice what you're feeling. Particularly if someone, you have compartmentalized your feelings and you don't tend to go there. It's a great place just to start with, I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling um, elated. Take three minutes in the car to be mindful about what's going on. I'm mindful, I'm aware that it's raining outside, that it's gray, that I'm feeling cold. All that's going to help you be more mindful in the moment. Also notice how you respond to emotions of others. Try to not immediately solve the problem. Um, Sorry, let me go back. You don't need to fix somebody else's emotions. And be curious, listen with empathy, and try not to have judgment. So I know that's, I think that's all the time that we have today. The, the sort of the wrap up is that technical skills and people skills are going to make you successful and better decision making if we use both. Um, I'm hoping that you're coming away looking at the four quadrants of Daniel Goleman that he put together starting with self-awareness, the stimulus response quote, looking at getting emotionally hijacked, habits that bring down our anxiety that might not be best for the, con- for the conflict, that's conviction connection. And finally, using the tool of the mush separator. And then lastly, you'll get in the slides, I have recommendations for books to read. And I know this is just a beginning and I have no more time, but I really thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and um, look forward to supporting you more and more and hope that some of this information can help you be more successful and effective in your relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Hartley. And everyone joining us online, join us again next month um, for our Legal Lunchbox. Thank you.